Praise the Lord. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, mighty King, sovereign of the universe, we praise you for the sacrifice that you, your Son, your Spirit were willing to make eons ago, Father, that we may have salvation. Help us, Father. Help us to be able to be covered by that grace as the law falls all around us. We ask your blessings. We ask your spirit, and on an individual level, that we come meekly and humbly before the high priest and allow him to cleanse us, and that we are usable by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're back in uh, Second Peter. Last week, we looked at, uh, to me, some pretty alarming things about uh, making the law of non-effect <laughs> through diet. Folks, you know, to me, the more I look into these things, it doesn't matter whose name is at the beginning of these epistles, because you know what? It's all about whom? Me. Who is this written to and for? A corporation or an individual? Peter, as we saw a couple of the events in his life, speaks from experience. Paul, as he writes, speaks from experience. John speaks from experience. Math, Luke, uh, Matthew and Luke, etc. James, all down the line. They're just giving their personal experiences as they move from one level of perfection to the next. And again, as I say, there is one thing that's missing in here that we are so accustomed to. Leadership. <laughs> yes, there's a gospel order, absolutely. However, it's not man's gospel order. It's the Holy Spirit's gospel order. However, Peter, when he denied his Savior, whom he said he was going to go to the cross with, wept bitterly in the night. A burly, powerful man, opinionated, strong-willed. Last thing you'd expect to see a guy like him was crying, but he did. And Jesus said to him, when you are converted, <laughs> huh? He said, back to Jesus, you're going to understand this. He said that about them all, but you know, it was individual. So as we read these things, as I read these things, I have to fill my name in there. And praise the Lord for people like Peter who were willing to do exactly what he did and become the example that we need in order to cycle into salvation, into eternity. And as we read on, Every word is just so loaded with experience, so loaded with example, and it's at a personal level because some of the words that were chosen here were actually a very used in a very personal application, not a corporate application. And when we apply them to ourselves, we become an army, strong and mighty, as it says in the Song of Solomon. Mighty with banners marshaled by the Lord of Sabaoth. I don't know how Jesus put up with these 12 guys. Because if you put them in a room together, what did you have? Were they not constantly at each other's throats? They were individuals. They were individuals. I mean, two of them got their mother to come to Jesus and ask for a position. I wonder if they're millennials. Think about it. What does it say in the Bible? Nothing new under the sun. What were these guys accustomed to? Think about that situation, folks. And now what did the other ones think about that? Really? They were in a foul mood for the rest of that day. 
Then another one was constantly undermining Jesus because he thought he knew better. He was a powerful man in certain circles. That was Judas. What was going on? What was Jesus dealing with? You know what, folks? He was dealing with us. So again, don't look at them too harsh because we're... <laughs> Unbelievable. I don't know how he dealt. Well, I do know because he was God and he knows best. I've heard from my kid. I don't know how you deal with that. <laughs> when they get older, they say that. They never say that when they're younger. Because that's what you're dealing with as a parent. <laughs> so. Anyhow, let's continue in Peter. But God has how many of us down here? And again, as we look through this, I want you to keep in mind that Jesus knew the demons personally, intimately. He worked with them. When we understand that the plan of salvation, as Mrs. White taught, and the Bible tells us clearly, was done before there was a rebellion, before there was a Lucifer, before there was a creation, because they knew, God knew that they would have to deal with it down the road. So the deal was made prior to the creation to deal with the situation. Jesus knew these so-called, the, not so-called, they were demons. He knew these rebellious angels. How hard was it for him to rebuke them? Even a parent that has a child that's the worst thing in the world, how hard is it, the most vile thing in the world, for that parent to condemn that child to death? Did you ever think about that? This is what he has to do with these demons and with Lucifer. But they made a choice. So not only us is he dealing with, who he knew intimately before we were born. Isn't that what David says? Isn't that what he says? He knew these angels that became the demons before they were created. See, I don't understand in their mind how that can work when they say that God is unfair because they knew that he knew, God being, that they were going to rebel and he created them anyway. So what's, where's their argument? Where's their argument? that he forces them to serve him by force. Where's their argument? He just didn't need... So that's a moot point, isn't it? It's a lie, isn't it? It comes down to one thing, selfishness. That's the problem. Because if you clearly understand that they knew, they being the Godhead, that this was going to happen, why did he create these beings? What was that? Love. Love, because he's honest because he had to have it play out. See, because I would have never created him, you see. <laughs> would you? Would you? If you knew you were going to be the mother of Charles Manson, would you have had Charles Manson? You see the problem? God did. <laughs> because he's fair and just. Remember what Jesus said? If you think about doing it, what did he say? What did he say? If you look at a woman with lust, real intent, you've done it. Because he holds himself to that standard too. So where is Lucifer's argument that God is unjust? His mere existence proves existence that God is not unjust. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't believe that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. What I mean by that is, you know, we just go with the flow. That's what I mean by that. Anyhow, let's continue on because Peter uses some interesting words here as we go back to 2 Peter 1, uh, and we stopped with uh, verse 2. <laughs> Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his divine power hath he given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of uh, him that called us unto glory and virtue, whereby we are given, unto, uh, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. By these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Okay. We like to go through these individuals. 
these words individually, and I want to come over here. We just hit the, the first word is what that Peter uses? Virtue, two definitions in the Bible in the New Testament. One that pertained to this blue stripe, and another one that pertains to us. Now you'll notice this whole outfit is built on top of what? What could you say? What is the foundation of this? That blue stripe represents it's part of virtue, power. And the whole thing is built on top of that. Here, virtue is to be part of our character. Now, the virtue that pertains to us is manliness, folks. Not given the current politics, that means mankind, women included. Valor, excellence. Valor is important. Has, has anybody gone back through Pilgrim's Progress? Did valor play a part in that? Fearless. By the way, on a side note, found a, uh, can't remember the name of the production, but if you go, you'll find it, a uh, 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 movie done on Pilgrim's Progress. Excellent. Watch it, especially you young guys. Watch it. I highly recommend you go and watch. It is to the point. It's better than the audio the way they kept to the book. And it's very relative and relevant to our time right now. That's why Mrs. White recommended it. Go home and watch it. Because it's going to hit you where you live. So uh, we are able to acquire this virtue, manliness, valor, excellence, Praise, virtue. And you see, the virtue that Christ had was different. The one that's referred to is specifically power. Did Jesus not say healing power went out of him? But he also said in another guy, I felt what go out of me? Virtue. Miracle, uh, and, uh, a miracle in of itself. Ability, it goes on and on, meaning might, mighty, strength, deed, miracle worker, worker of miracles, power, strength, violence, might, wonderful work. That's what this costume is built on. Why violence? Why is that part of the definition of Christ's virtue? What violence? What is it? Will he do violence to the kingdom of the devil? Yes. When he returns at the Lord of Sabaoth, is he going to be a pauper or a conquering king coming back? It's a strange work, but he's going to do it. We don't understand these words today because, you see, Hollywood has defined them for us. But violence is part of the virtue of Christ. You better believe it. Do you think he was not imposing violence when he went through the temple with a whip? So much so, what happened? Did the priests even stop and call the temple guard, or did they take off? There was a little bit of violence implied there. <laughs> you see? He can be as violent as a storm to us is violent. So it's part of the rock that this is built on, that this priesthood is built on, that blue stripe. It's no mistake it's the bottom of this robe. It's no mistake at all. None whatsoever. It's built on power, miracle working power, healing power spiritually and physically. And we're to have a portion of that virtue. When it says manliness, what does that mean? Responsible for your actions? Responsible in, 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 in your duties? Owning up to, your, to what you do. And, and they all come under that same thing of responsibility. The responsibility of being a Christian. The responsibility of being Christ. You see, Peter had to learn that, didn't he? Did Peter have to learn, have to learn that he could not serve God in his way? Did Peter have to learn that he couldn't keep telling Jesus, you've offended the Pharisees? 
because Peter had to go out and offend the Pharisees at one point in his experience, didn't he? And not on purpose. But there's going to be a clash of religion here. There is going to be a clash of theology. The Pharisees thought that they had um, humiliated and intimidated the disciples at Christ's crucifixion. But was it true? For a minute. For a minute. But was it true? They were shocked when they saw Peter spe speaking. With power and might, with manliness. A woman can speak with manliness too. It's a term used to describe a psychological condition of a human being. So this virtue, and, and, and he calls us to glory and virtue. They're locked together. What is glory synonymous with in, in, in Hebrew? Character. The glory of God is also his character. So you have a character, if you will, with manliness. Does that make sense? In the Old English, it makes a lot of sense. Power. Our power or Christ's power? See that blue stripe? <laughs> See that blue stripe? Whose power is it? Stop. I felt virtue has gone out of me. Well, what are you, nuts? How do you know somebody's touched you? That's what they said to Jesus, isn't it? I felt power go out of me. Power for what? Two things. To heal physically and spiritually. This woman tried everything. She went through every program there was. Tried everything there was. Gave all her money. Yeah, you're dead. But one little touch of that blue stripe. One little touch of that blue stripe. In an ocean of people. The whole world. We can reach out. You see, and that word virtue tells me that it's personal to me. We can reach out. No matter how thick the clouds are. No matter how many millions and billions of people there are, we can reach out with our last bit of strength and touch the power, the healing power of Jesus Christ. And what will happen? The whole world will stop. And what will Jesus do? Who touched me? He knew who touched him. He made himself available to that woman. And of course, as we talked before, that woman represents the church too, doesn't it? All that woman has to, all the church has to do, forget your leaders, I'm not saying they're bad or they're not, but don't idolize them. And touch that power right there. And it's all, you know how quick the, this whole thing would be over? You know, Mrs. White said that after the 2300 days, there is no more time. No more time. Time doesn't matter anymore. Did you know that? Did you know she said that? That makes sense. We're off the map. It wasn't supposed to go on this long. So, when we touch that blue stripe, we get our own character. And the character, by the way, that we have to have to get into the kingdom. Because remember in Pilgrim's Progress, what was Christian given? He was given something that he had to carry with him. What was it? What was it? A certificate. He had to present it at the gate. He was at a point in his travel, he was given a scroll. And he had to present it at the gate. And him and Hopeful are the ones that made it to the gate. But there was somebody there who didn't, ignorant. Oh, I don't need that scroll. What did that scroll represent, you think, to Bunyan? What would that represent? You see that virtue? The character, the power, the glory it has to be presented or you're not going to be led into the city. It's that simple. This chain, to me, as I read that, is the scroll that Christian was given, that he couldn't lose, you see, because he had to have that to present to the gatekeeper, to be led into the... You remember the story, right? Go read it again. But I tell you, 
for our vernacular, uh, I, later I can give you who the producer of it, but I'm, I'm telling you, it was right on the money. It was right on the money. All of a sudden, you become Christian. And it's okay, because it is a parable. So don't, well, we're not supposed to do this. But they did not dramatize it too much. It's there. Everything's there that needs to be there. So this virtue he was given, or we will be given, whereby, verse 4, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So when we have the glory and the power, we can use these promises. What got Christian to the kingdom, by the way? One thing, the promises. Because when he got off the path, when he was in the dungeon of despair, and so what the promises, but you see constantly the devil was trying to make him forget what? The ultimate deception was to forget the promises. And the path was hard and arduous, and the rests were few and far between. But the trouble was constantly coming, the deception. And the deception was coming from so-called Christians, for the most part. Leaders in the church, remember the story. It's amazing that that was written when it was, but it is so relevant today because it is our path. It is our path. Every wind of doctrine is blowing. Every wind of doctrine is blowing. This is what this story is about. This is what uh, Bunyan was dealing with. Amazing. So it goes on that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption. Cody was talking about leprosy today. A good way to describe leprosy is corruption, because that's exactly, you rot to death. You literally, stuff falls off your body. You rot to death. Spiritual corruption, your mind rots to death that is in the world through lust, and I'm telling you, uh, lust today, and of course, the older people in this room, what do we see lust as? What do we see? Sex. The forbidden fruits. However, this lust is everything in the world. You've got to have this, you've got to have that, you've got to have this, you've got to have that, you've got to have this. That's lust. Wanting Vanity Fair. It's amazing how it fits. What, why did I say Vanity Fair? Again, Pilgrim's Progress. What was the city that faithful was burned in? Vanity Fair. But they had all of these things, and they bore witness against them. I'm telling you, man, go back through that, whatever media, media you decide to use, and you know what? You're going to see yourself as that Christian. It's amazing. It's, a, it's amazing. I, I don't know. It, it blows my mind. And besides this, giving all due diligence to your faith, virtue, and to virtue knowledge. And there's that word again, virtue. There's that word again. You notice it keeps reappearing? Knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. That word charity does not mean opening a soup kitchen. That's charity. You see, biblically, and in the old vernacular, that's charity. Why did I say that? What did Jesus give up to do that? Let me put it this way. What didn't he give up to do that? That's charity. That's charity. That's the charity. Remember Jesus said, a new commandment I give you? What did he say? That you love one another as I have loved you? That's charity. That's what he was taught. We talked about this before. That's what he was talking. Be prepared to die for your virtue, for your godliness. You see how that works? And you know what, folks? To me, this connects, and I think this, in, 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 in Peter's mind, he was writing the 51st Psalm. Because once this is done, what is the end product of what Peter just described here? Charity. Now, you can't sit in your own house and practice charity. Where do you have to practice that? Where do you give all for the cause, for your manliness? Understand, I'm going to say it again, that applies to women too. We're not talking swings here. 
we're talking vernacular and definition. Where would you do that? Out in the world. Where did Jesus do it? Where did he do it? That's exactly the 51st Psalm right there. Now, I ask you a question. Where is man interjected in here? Where? Where is a system interjected in here? Remember last week, we saw that while Peter was clearly, clearly trying to protect the, the person he loved, Jesus Christ, and he said, never shall you go to the, die this way. Who was standing between Peter and Jesus? Now, this was one of the leaders of the new church, of the new Christian church. Who was standing between them? Satan. So if for this charity, if we go to man, now when I say charity, I'm talking about this chain of character and personality and activity that was just created here, which by the way, Peter had to go through. Was it easy for him? Never did he ever do anything in his life or ever will do anything in his life as difficult as this chiseling right here. When I say chiseling, molding. Because once he achieved the charity, it didn't matter. He said, no, don't kill me the way you killed my, my master. You turned me upside down. Is this the guy that cursed to prove he didn't know Christ? No, this is the guy that acquired the charity. He had that blue stripe, you see. Was Israel, did Israel, were they supposed to have a blue stripe on their clothing? Yes. Did they agree to have that blue stripe? What did they do with it? They put a man there. You can't build on top of a man. That's the, the, the ridiculous assertion that Rome is built on Peter. By definition, it is then corrupt. Because as we established last week, not a, we, the Bible, who was standing between Peter and Jesus? So you want to tell me your faith is built on a man, immediately I point you to the spirit of prophecy and to the scriptures telling you that if that's the case, then you're serving Lucifer. Who did Jesus say the Pharisee's father was? The devil. Folks, beware of who you lend your mind to. And when we see Lucifer being called the prince of the airways, what are we doing with all these electronic devices and claiming to be God's people? Now, Al showed us how we can use them. But when we go home and we turn that computer on and we sit there, we don't know what's going in here. Do you remember, for those of us who were functioning as adults back then, what the big issue was with advertising back in the 80s? you remember that? Subliminable messages. Do you remember that? And they proved how effective they are? Now that's just through here. Do you, you, you remember that? I'm sure a song, right? Jessup, Yvonne, Al, well, Jim. I don't know if you guys want, but this was a big issue back in the 80s. Advertisers putting subliminal messages. And what that was, was underneath there were little messages that were hidden on top and it was affecting the subconscious to get people to buy things. They proved how well it worked. What is the eye called? What is it? The lamp? So when you're sitting there on that computer and on your handheld device, now I know we're using YouTube, but I hope those people open the books once their mind has been pricked. What's going in here? Now, and again, Al was a big IT guy. That's what he did. But Al has shown us how to use it to glorify God. And the devil hates it. So when you let your children sit there hour after hour after hour, they're hypnotized just as surely as Eve was at the tree. And more effectively, like it or not, folks, it's human nature. It is the way we are made. Dave Hunt, whom I hesitate to quote, had made the statement in a book, Image of the Godmakers, the mind 
is a machine that any ghost can operate. That's a fact. And there's only one ghost that can operate it that will protect it. Who is that? The Holy Ghost. And who are we at war with as a people? How the devil laughs. And we claim to be enlightened. And we claim to be the people of knowledge. You'll notice in this chain where knowledge comes in. After the virtue. After the manliness. After the responsibility of being a... And it's a great responsibility. Great responsibility. There's much that we have to give up. The 1844 movement, as it was presented to the Adventist church, was not presented in its entire truth. Yes, a judgment started, but there was something else that started that has been totally and greatly ignored for the most part. What else started in 1844? Something else started that's far more important than the judgment. And you say, how could you say that? I know people are mad at me because of what I said about the judgment. But if you're walking according to Christ, why are you worried about the judgment? But if you're worried about the judgment, what else are you going to be worried about? How are you going to be any good to anybody else? I want, folks, because we're going to hear a chapter out of early writings that pertains directly to what we're talking about. And, well, this one will do just fine. I'm sure you'll be able to hear it. This has been greatly missed. I've never heard one sermon preached on it. Because you know why? It doesn't fit their agenda. Yes, the investigative judgments start. But can anybody in here sit here and tell me when it's going to end? Or if it hasn't ended already? We don't know that. Also, it ends first for who? Church. The church. When did it end? When is it going to end? How long is it going to run? I don't know. Time matters no more, Mrs. White said. After the 23, after 1844, time was irrelevant. Then it was event. Listen to this. Chapter 6, The Open and the Shut Door. Sabbath, March 24, 1849. We had a sweet and very interesting meeting with the brethren at Topson, Maine. The Holy Ghost was poured out upon us, and I was taken off in the spirit to the city of the living God. Then I was shown that the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ relating to the shut door could not be separated, and that the time for the commandments of God to shine out with all their importance, and for God's people to be tried on the Sabbath truth, was when the door was opened in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, where the ark is, in which are contained the Ten Commandments. This door was not opened until the mediation of Jesus was finished in the holy place of the sanctuary in 1844. Then Jesus rose up and shut the door of the holy place, and opened the door into the most holy, and passed within the second veil where he now stands by the ark, and where the faith of Israel now reaches. I saw that Jesus had shut the door of the holy place, and no man can open it. Important point. He shut the door of the holy place, and no man can open it. That's very important. A lot of the ministries that are here now are shut. You'll notice that in 1844, it was the Sabbath, and the Ten Commandments would become the focus. Did you catch that? What do you always hear about it? Investigative judgment. If you're keeping the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments, what does the judgment matter? That he had opened the door into the most holy, and no man can shut it. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And that since Jesus has opened the door into the most holy place, which contains the ark, the commandments have been shining out to God's people, and they are being tested on the Sabbath question. I saw that the present test on the Sabbath could not come until the mediation of Jesus in the holy place was finished, and he had passed within the second veil. Therefore, 
Christians who fell asleep before the door was opened into the Most Holy, when the midnight cry was finished at the seventh month, 1844, and who had not kept the true Sabbath, now rest in hope. For they had not the light and the test on the Sabbath, which we now have since that door was opened. I saw that Satan was tempting some of God's people on this point. Because so many good Christians have fallen asleep in the triumphs of faith, and have not kept the true Sabbath, they were doubting about its being a test for us now. The enemies of the present truth have been trying to open the door of the holy place that Jesus has shut, and to close the door of the most holy place, which he opened in 1844, where the ark is, containing the two tables of stone on which are written the Ten Commandments. Another point. What is, what, what is present truth, according to what the Holy Spirit just said? What is present truth? the Sabbath, and the Ten Commandments of God. And that Adventists were trying to shut that door. The Sabbath and the Ten Commandments. You just heard it. Present truth from the prophet. The finger of Jehovah. Satan is now using every device in this sealing time to keep the minds of God's people from the present truth and to cause them to waver. I saw a covering that God was drawing over his people to protect them in the time of trouble. And every soul that was decided on the truth and was pure in heart was to be covered with the covering of the Almighty. Satan knew this, and he was at work in mighty power to keep the minds of as many people as he possibly could wavering and unsettled on the truth. I saw that the mysterious knocking in New York and other places was the power of Satan, and that such things would be more and more common, clothed in a religious garb, so as to lull the deceived to greater security, and to draw the minds of God's people, if possible, to those things, and cause them to doubt the teachings and power of the Holy Ghost. I saw that Satan was working through agents. Now Given what you just heard the prophets say, is there a doubting of the Holy Ghost now in the church? What is the root of it? Spiritualism. Isn't that interesting? Spiritualism is the root of it, folks. So there is a great deal of spiritualism in the Seventh-day Adventist church, isn't there? And by the way, be, the medical work is coming under that if we're not careful that we don't perform it in the manner that God tells us to. Healings and so on and so forth. We have to be totally and firmly connected to the Holy Spirit. And as Cody pointed out in Sabbath school, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, was pressed out of him because of what? Because he took our sins on him. That's what I meant when I said earlier, I have some adjustments to make in my life if I want to see this through to the end. ...in a number of ways. He was at... You've got to be kidding me. I saw that a sacrifice did not increase, but it decreased and was consumed. I all folks, I'm sorry, that's the next one. False reformations would increase and spread. The reformations that were shown me were not reformations from error to truth. My accompanying angel bade me look for the travel of soul for sinners as used to be. I looked, but could not see it for the time for their salvation is past. The writer of these words did not understand them as teaching that the time for the salvation of all sinners was past. At the very time when these things were written, she herself was laboring for the salvation of sinners, as she has been doing ever since. This is her talking and... Her understanding her of the matter, as it has been presented to her, is given in the following paragraphs, the first published in 1854 and the second in 1888. The false reformations here referred to are yet to be more fully seen. The view relates more particularly to those who have heard and rejected the light of the Advent doctrine. They are given over to strong delusions. Such will not have the travel of soul for sinners as formerly. Having rejected the Advent 
and being given over to the delusions of Satan, the time for their salvation is past. This does not, however, relate to those who have not heard and rejected the doctrine of the second advent. It is a fearful thing to treat lightly the truth which has convinced our understanding and touched our hearts. We cannot with impunity reject the warnings which God in mercy sends us. A message was sent from heaven to the world in Noah's day, and the salvation of men depended upon the manner in which they treated that message. Because they rejected the warning, the Spirit of God was withdrawn from the sinful race, and they perished in the waters of the flood. In the time of Abraham, mercy ceased to plead with the guilty inhabitants of Sodom, and all but Lot with his wife and two daughters were consumed by the fire sent down from heaven. So in the days of Christ, the Son of God declared to the unbelieving Jews of that generation, Your house is left unto you desolate. Looking down to the last days, the same infinite power declares concerning those who receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. As they reject the teachings of his word, God withdraws his spirit and leaves them to the deceptions which they love. Folks, that's pretty straightforward. Um, I want to play one more. And, you know, I'm doing this because it's much better this way than hearing it from me. This is from the horse's mouth. This is Duty in View of Our Time of Trouble, Chapter 11. Chapter 11, Duty in View of the Time of Trouble. The Lord has shown me repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them, or in the field in the time of trouble, when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it would be taken from them by violent hands, and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God, and He will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time, and that we shall not lack or suffer hunger, for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, he would send ravens to feed us, as he did to feed Elijah, or rain manna from heaven, as he did for the Israelites. Houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble, for they will then have to flee before infuriated mobs, and at that time their possessions cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of present truth. I was shown that it is the will of God that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance before the time of trouble comes, and make a covenant with God through sacrifice. If they have their property on the altar, and earnestly inquire of God for duty, he will teach them when to dispose of these things. Then they will be free in the time of trouble, and have no clogs to weigh them down. I saw that if any held on to their property and did not inquire of the Lord as to their duty, he would not make duty known, and they would be permitted to keep their property, and in the time of trouble it would come up before them like a mountain to crush them, and they would try to dispose of it, but would not be able. I heard some mourn like this, the cause was languishing, God's people were starving for the truth, and we made no effort to supply the lack. Now our property is useless. Oh, that we had let it go, and laid up treasure in heaven. I saw that a sacrifice did not increase, but it decreased and was consumed. I also saw that God had not required all of his people to dispose of their property at the same time, but if they desired to be taught, he would teach them, in a time of need, when to sell and how much to sell. Some have been required to dispose of their property in times past to sustain the Advent cause, while others have been permitted to keep theirs until a time of need. Then, as the cause needs it, their duty is to sell. 
I saw that the message, Sell that ye have, and give alms, has not been given by some in its clear light, and the object of the words of our Savior has not been clearly presented. The object of selling is not to give to those who are able to labor and support themselves, but to spread the truth. It is a sin to support and indulge in idleness those who are able to labor. Some have been zealous to attend all the meetings, not to glorify God, but for the loaves and fishes. Such would much better have been at home, laboring with their hands the thing that is good to supply the wants of their families and to have something to give to sustain the precious cause of present truth. Now is the time to lay up treasure in heaven and to set our hearts in order ready for the time of trouble. Those only who have clean hands and pure hearts will stand in that trying time. Now is the time for the law of God to be in our minds, foreheads, and written in our hearts. The Lord has shown me the danger of letting our minds be filled with worldly thoughts and cares. I saw that some minds are led away from present truth and a love of the Holy Bible by reading other exciting books. Others are filled with perplexity and care for what they shall eat, drink, and wear. Some are looking too far off for the coming of the Lord. Time has continued a few years longer than they expected. Therefore, they think it may continue a few years more, and in this way their minds are being led from present truth out after the world. In these things I saw great danger, for if the mind is filled with other things, present truth is shut out, and there is no place in our foreheads for the seal of the living God. I saw that the time for Jesus to be in the most holy place was nearly finished, and that time can last but a very little longer. What leisure time we have should be spent in searching the Bible, which is to judge us in the last day. My dear brethren and sisters, let the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ be in your minds continually, and let them crowd out worldly thoughts and cares. When you lie down and when you rise up, let them be your meditation. Live and act wholly in reference to the coming of the Son of Man. The sealing time is very short and will soon be over. Now is the time, while the four angels are holding the four winds, to make our calling and election sure. Interesting. The Holy Spirit just told us that if we are not connected to doing these things, we will lose sight of present truth, which present truth, according to the Holy Spirit, is what? The Sabbath and the Ten Commandments. And we're to give everything we have to do what? Promote this. In the, first, folks, remember the 51st Psalm. And then I can do that. You see, the word charity that's used here by Peter is exactly that. Because did Peter do that? That's exactly what he did. And did Peter find solace in the church? No, he was the church, if you will, in his influence. I'm not saying that he was God. That's not the point of the Holy Spirit. Well, for all intent and purpose, when Peter and the apostles and the teachers were present, who was present? Who was present? The Holy Spirit. What does that tell us? And I hear all these especially independent Adventists. Now you know why Al's going, I think. Does that make sense? Because he's going to help other people get online with these things. When we are present, what should be there? If we, we talk about apostolic, uh, uh, getting back to primitive religion, there's only one way. It's this word right here, which can, well, charity. And in doing so, we have to give up. Jesus said, the prince of this world come, and, well, you know, I got a piece of land over there, and, you know, I'm doing this over here. No, he has 
nothing in me. Did not that prince offer Jesus the world on a platter? And what did he say? The same God, the same Lord who said, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, because I own the cattle on a thousand hills. How could Lucifer offer him anything other than to die in a lake of fire with him as a man? That's what he wanted to do. So, folks, I don't know. And then again, we don't have time, but chapter 16 talks about what we're supposed to be doing just before the plagues. To me, this is getting back to primitive religion, going back to the roots of our prophet and listening to the instruction she gives. Not making an issue out of this and an issue out of that, which all she just said will pull us away from present truth and create a new so-called presence truth, which is a revival by the leaders. But who is the actual conductor on the train, by the way? Satan. And she said, the whole world appeared to be on that train. Read the book. Go back to Pilgrim's Progress. Do what the Holy Spirit says. And if you don't feel something change inside, you got a problem. When I say you, it's a generic. I have a problem. You see, then the Holy Spirit's gone. Does that make sense? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne, Lord, a wretched people, but your grace is sufficient. Father, help us to get in line, Father, our lives in line with your precepts, your ten precepts, with your holy Sabbath, to keep it as Jesus did, not as men say. If it were up to them, we wouldn't be keeping it at all. Father, help us to overcome each and every person in this room and in my hearing and that in our realm of influence, that where we go, the Holy Spirit is there. That we have no sin in our life, that he may assist and lead. And that we may simply be virtuous, Father. Please be with us. Please help us to overcome our own selves. And every person is a very different place. And if we live up to the light that we have, we are perfect but that light continually moves and shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. Please be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.